Welcome to another episode of Racket Society. Uh, Cezzy and I are thrilled to be joined by two amazing musicians, Hannah Collins and Clara Lyon, who have provided us with an incredibly eclectic and amazing playlist, which uh, you can check out in the video or the little links below this video. Uh, we'll also post it on, on YouTube and other places like that. But uh, thank you so much for joining us. And I would love it if you all could just give us some insights into why you put together this list and... Uh, um, also, just um, you put it together amazingly fast, which is like major couples goals. I was like, holy cow, they get along so well. They just like were able to together make this playlist in like 24 hours and send it to us. So thank you for doing that. That was awesome. But uh, yeah, tell us about it. Tell us about all this uh, eclectic stuff. I think the secret to couples goals success was to just not try to make every decision together. So this is a playlist that reflects, you know, we sort of thought of it as like a multi-level, like stuff we'd listen to together, stuff that we would listen to secretly without the other person knowing we were listening to it. Um, so it's not a linear, uh, linear playlist. And I saw, you know, your episode, Chris, you kind of mentioned that you, you had more of a mixtape approach, less of a, a, a linear listening approach. So that's very much the model we, we took. Yeah, it's awesome. There's, uh, well, I didn't know that, but that's super interesting. Now I have to figure out who picked what to put on the playlist. This is going to be like a game of Jeopardy or something. But uh, um, I mean, we can talk about the first track right off the bat. Um, this artist that, correct me if I'm wrong, but has Spectral worked with this uh, play, uh, musician before? Is that how I know the name? That's number one. Uh, yes. Miguel Zanon, yeah. Um, amazing track. And anything that just goes into like weird polymetric tempo, stuff immediately just like my composer brain is just so happy because that's like Stravinsky bar talk all the music that I just love like that's just where it it resides and so uh, how did you get to know this person and uh, tell us about this this track yeah um maybe I'll drink us too much you can stop me if I am but it's it's kind of a funny story how we got to know Miguel um before my time with Spectral, actually, uh, the album that they recorded right before I joined them was with a great accordion player and Bendonian player, uh, Julian Lebro. And he had uh, written an arrangement of a Miguel tune. And just so happened, um, you know, thanks to Twitter, just so happened that they found out that they were, you know, in the recording studio recording this Miguel arrangement when Miguel happened to be passing through Chicago. And so they were like, hey, we're recording your tune. Do you want to like come and lay down a solo? And he was like, sure. And it was a really badass solo because he's Miguel and he's awesome. Um, and so that led to, you know, them um, some back and forth. And uh, Hyde Park Jazz Festival here in Chicago commissioned Miguel to write a string quartet. Um, well, a piece for string quartet and him. Um, so it's a concert length piece he wrote for us. Um, we toured that and recorded it a few years ago, and we're lucky enough um, for that album to be nominated for a Grammy. And it's a it's a wonderful piece. Um, and it, a Latin Grammy. And a Latin Grammy. That's true. Um, Crossover. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah, and I mean, Miguel's just um, become a really uh, just a, a, like a lovely person to uh, correspond with and have a kind of long form collaboration with. So he wrote us that piece, but he's um, about to write us another piece, um, this, this time just for us, no saxophone. And we invited him to do a sort of listening event with Spectral. And this is the only um, tune that he brought of his own. Um, wow. The one that we're sharing with you tonight. Uh, he has, I mean, he's one of the most omnivorous musicians that I know, um, also very eclectic listener um so his his event his playlist was super fun and this track um is music of a teacher of his um sort of uh, reinterpreted um and yeah i mean we love this first track because it's so good i mean like it's immediately out of on purpose you know out of sync like sort of like playing around with the time it's very um very playful like it like just like draws you in immediately so, yeah it's so great i mean it's it's just um 
the, he talks about this Ismael Rivera, the, who, the whole album's dedicated to just as just like one of the, you know, heroes. And I don't know, to me, it's just such a rare thing, like as a someone who teaches instrumental music, you know, the whole story we're always telling and, and what we're going for, you're trying to equip yourself with as many technical tools so that you can just like be free to express anything. And I, I feel like Miguel is like maybe my leading example of someone who can actually do that like he practices all the time he listens to music all the time mm. and then he is able to just sort of play these it's all the virtuosity you want all the technique you want all the knowledge of music that you want but with like none of the bad stuff none of the ego problems mm. like even this album is a tribute album and it doesn't feel like he's saying like oh i'm gonna take this and blow your mind with how I'm reinventing it. It's just, it just feels like you get to jump in and he loves this music so much and it's just like exploding out of him because he loves, you know, what he's tributing so much. I don't know. I, th I think there's so many good vibes here. Yeah, that's yeah, absolutely true. true. It's a very positive vibe kind of like track that if that's the first track of a playlist, I think it's just like totally sells the playlist, you know, like <laughs> tell me the track. Yeah, I, I did listen to it repeatedly. It's it's really great. Yeah, and the, the second track also, I thought immediately was like equally playful. And, um, you know, I love, I mean, anything that like samples just like a classical drum machine or something. It sounds like it comes out of one of those organs or something that people used to have in their living rooms or something. You know, this like drum sound. I can't even uh, remember what it's called, but uh, just super clever, super beautiful. And, you know, has this playful vibe, but then it starts to like feel... Uh, this this is the Michael Patrick Avery track I'm talking about now, like dot 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 mm -hmm. machine, and it it starts to actually ha take on this almost like chill, slightly like almost even like melancholic or something. There's something very cool about the way that it's very playful, but then it starts to feel like deeper and deeper. Um, I don't know if that's just from the layering of those like really cool harmonies or the way that people play each line in a certain kind of way, but. I don't know. What are your thoughts about that? That track is actually super interesting and much more comp like sophisticated in its like affect or whatever than it maybe comes off immediately, or at least it like leaves a really strong impression on the listener. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Michael is someone that I also got to work with here in Chicago. Uh, he is amazing thinker. Um, I love that the album itself is called play. Um, there's another track on the album that is, completely built by taking do you remember those old like fisher price record players yeah um so he's got like you know six of them set up and he's just kind of like playing dj basically and and <laughs> taking one off and putting one on and I, I think the track is called like fisher price actually um but this one we chose um basically just because we like the the vibe a lot um we felt like it would be you know contrasting uh but you should totally listen to the whole album because it is it's really fun it's short um and i agree um i mean with what you said it's super complex it's like i love that it's like um there's a line i think between you know what uh it makes you guess kind of about its creation like what is um what was maybe a happy accident that happened in the studio or, you know, what was, um, what was chosen after the fact and, and then reassembled maybe, or, you know, like I actually have no idea, uh, how this track was created. I have heard a live version that was a bit different. So, um, yeah, I mean, I love that it kind of like invites you to wonder about like how the music itself was made. Yeah. It's super interesting. Very cool. um, kind of like goes on this kind of like ostinato like thing at the back that keeps kind of like repeating it, it's one of those tracks that sort of like calms you down and centers you so that you start actually paying more attention because of the repetition so that's why mm -hmm. each layer's entrance sort of like makes you kind of like oh okay now this no now that like yeah that's really nice that it kind of holds your hand and that you go along I, I really like that about it that's so true yeah it kind of like it paces you to, it puts you in the right place for the, exactly. yeah, for the rest of the track to unfold. That's, that's, that's yeah. true. Those would both fall under the category of like, listen together while cooking type of tracks. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Totally. That's awesome. 
Um, but that's actually a nice transition. The kind of melodic harmonies and lines from that track are really nice transition into the Susan Alcorn quintet track, which has a similar kind of like very intentional, intentional pacing to it. And it like is always kind of like in control of that, even though it doesn't, you don't, aren't really aware of it, but like, there's this sense of like really being aware of like how this music is like moving and how it's affecting somebody and like creating that atmosphere and letting that atmosphere kind of be what it is. Um, and I say this a little bit because I, I saw her perform in St. Louis a few years ago, uh, just a solo show. And she, she played like Messian and all this sort of stuff on the pedal steel. And it was just like one of the most beautiful concerts because it was very brilliant, but very understated. And it's like brilliance. And I kind of got the vibe from this track from that as well. But where did you come across uh, this music? This, I don't know if it's called Pedernal or Padernal, or I actually don't know how to pronounce it or if it's a made up word I don't know but <laughs> I don't know either it's a mystery um I feel embarrassed to say that I came to this like pretty recently this is definitely like a uh, in quarantine discovery um thanks to uh Peter Margusak who is a uh, curator of um, a great series here in Chicago and also a really excellent music writer this was on his you know year end best albums of 2020 list and he's sort of a, a go-to person of mine um, when I'm looking for new things to listen to because I feel like I trust his taste a lot. So I just happened to find this and um, on a day that I really wished that I was leaving my apartment, you know, like it's been so long that, <laughs> that um, I mean, for us, we were took, you know, one car trip back to the East Coast. Uh, this whole year. And beyond that, you know, it's been so long since we've had that experience of like, I live in Chicago and that's where we are right now. And that experience of like leaving the city behind you and sort of like seeing like, um, you know, enter suburbia and then it becomes more rural and like those layers that you get, like as you leave the city is what I was imagining when I was listening to this music. And it just felt like perfect time for me to encounter it even though it was like <laughs> imagine it <laughs> new to me yeah to have made me imagine um like be, having it taking a road trip again and that was fun that's cool actually sort of like what you said made me actually realize how much like all the music that we sort of like carry with us when we travel sort of like gets colored with all the places that we go to you know like that's one of the things. Of course, we turn very much to music and to new music in a time like this where you can't go places. But another thing that we actually lost is that, that we were taking the music with us to places. And the music was kind of like going through different experiences and then shaping your own experience of wherever you were, etc. So we have been missing that quite a bit. For sure. Totally. I, I feel like related to that for me, I have so much music that I've just like listened to while moving, you know, like I have like whole like albums that like I've basically listened to only on trains or like albums that I've listened to only in a car. And it's right. even if it's not associated with a particular place, it's always this memory of like you're in motion somehow. Um, and that's something we haven't experienced either. Yep. The transition, the liminal, like I'm in transition space of being on a plane and just being nowhere and, and having that be your your geography or your, you know, the space that you're living in. That's Which that's can be very exhilarating if you're not just like flying all the time and you're really tired <laughs> of it. <laughs> True. Totally. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, that's, yeah, that's really interesting. Like a cool way to think about it. And uh, speaking of liminal spaces... I was geeking out hard over this next track, this Tarek Yamani track. I hoped you would. <laughs> because of the <laughs> mixture of like Western and non-Western scales and intonations at various points are, I mean, and the way that like leaning into the differences in the scales at those in the certain moments. I mean, sometimes it's like in one or in, in one or the other, but when they're like colliding in a, like, oh man, yeah. that is like such an incredible sound. And I didn't know this artist and I don't really know this like afro terab like music um at all and i'm gonna dig like way further you know into it but what uh yeah tell us more about this this artist or how how you came to know their music or this track yeah um Tarek is actually going to be a uh, another spectral collaborator um coming up he's writing us a piece um that he'll play on i think a few um 
movements of, and then the rest of it will just be the quartet. Um, but it's going to be, um, I mean, I'm already nervous about it because he's kind of sent us like just a little bit of what he's working on. And it's like, definitely very much in the style of this is going to require us to, you know, be able to improvise in um, Afro Terra modes. It's going to require us to have that kind of um, rhythmic complexity and interplay at the same time. So, I mean, it's definitely going to make us like up our game a little bit. Like it's going to be a challenge for sure. Um, and when we first started uh, thinking about working with him, um, he had just put out this album not that long before. Um, and this is the first track that I listened to and the one that I keep going back to, like it just gets stuck in my head because it's, I mean, it's super complex, but it's also like got a really good groove, right? Like it's like, it's got such an excellent hook. I don't know, I just love it. I love that. I didn't know that there was any like anxiety associated with this as the non-spectral quartet member. I just like, Let's, this is a jam. Let's keep listening to it. Having no idea that it was like, there was a sense of anticipation. So that's the, the fun thing about getting to know spectral quartet collaborators as a non-quartet member. I don't have to worry about having to actually play that lick or anything. Wow. That's an amazing challenge, but that's exciting. I'm Holy cow, and I'd get to learn it from somebody like that. It would be like incredible. I actually did start listening to more of his stuff on YouTube because this was too good. So I just went on and on and on. <laughs> it, it, totally. I listened to him. I, this is amazing. I mean, to some degree, because I'm from Turkey, it, it sort of like is very much has a kind of homey feel to it too, because of, uh -huh. yeah, I mean, those musics are very similar to each other, of course, from the same region. But this kind of mixture of it, I haven't heard. Because of course, there are a lot of jazz musicians from Turkey too, who sort of try the, you know, like modes, etc., cetera, makams, et cetera, in, in, in jazz. But he's doing a little bit of a different thing. So I, I, I really liked it a lot. It's really awesome that you introduced us to him. Uh, I will definitely keep, continue listening to it. In the same way that Miguel Zenon has this extremely positive vibe, this one has it too. So Absolutely. It's great, really, in, in so many aspects, yeah. Yeah, well, speaking of Spectral Quartet, nah. now you get to talk to us a little bit about, uh, you know, Johannes Brahms. So, yeah, all right, so this one's all... This is me. This, one. <laughs> <laughs> this would fall into the category of, like, I'm secretly listening to this. Um, you know, the quartet put out this album in August, a double album, epic, you know, including Brahms' C minor quartet, Schoenberg third quartet, you know, music by George Lewis, um, Ruth Crawford Seeger, Sam Pluta, Charmaine Lee, you figured anybody? Um, so, you know, I know that she has listened to edits and tracks and has listened to that album all she probably wants to possibly for life <laughs> <laughs> as any musician who puts out an album sort of once it goes out you're like great I don't need to listen to that anymore so I secretly listen to this on my own <laughs> but um I have to say that I I um I chose this track because I have like a special uh, affinity for this piece but also for this track and also because I have a secret um I had a secret plan that has been unfolding for years to, to influence the minds of Spectral Quartet, which I will <laughs> claim credit for right now, whether it's true or not. But um, just that uh, I grew up listening to the Tokyo Quartet and these old older recordings um, that probably were done with, you know, very few takes. And every once in a while you're listening and somebody just really goes for something, you know, like really goes for some colossal moment, takes the time or drops the bass or does something that really stands out. And it, it's like having, you know, made recordings, it's really hard to, to, to keep those moments safe when you're trying to track a record because it's just so easy for there to be, yeah, but there was a click sound or there, it was out of tune and we just can't. Um, so, you know, my, my, my secret plot was to share this Tokyo re quartet recording, which really goes for this epic C string moment in the coda um, in, of the cello part. And to share it with Clara, just like years ago when they first started working on this piece. <laughs> <laughs> and just think like, so amazing how they captured that in, in a record, you know, and they really got it on there and just sort of like, 
much. But um, so I'm really pleased that I think that this track that they I'm like, you know, proud spouse, right? Like that they did they did it. They like this track is like so close to the edge and like in the coda, they so go for it that it really goes outside of that sort of safe studio zone um, in in the same way. So you know, it's all them, but I, I was like really hoping that it would come out like this. <laughs> and I'm really excited about how it came out. So I secretly listened to it and just like, yeah. And, uh, but I try not to torture, torture her with it too many times. That's awesome. <laughs> it's extremely vibrant. That does come, come across for sure. And again, like this would be a kind of like good Good track to kind of like make you sort of like curious about the rest of the CD, I think, because if there's such kind of like liveliness in this one, what more is there sort of thing? So it's, it's yeah, it's lovely because I didn't have time yet to listen to the rest, but that it did make me want to listen to the rest. So, yes. Well, that's the best endorsement you could give Thank a track. You. It's true. But, yeah. you know, and it is true that the, the sort of in the context, like I didn't, you know, know what their plans were for recording when you first started playing it was more about programming it for a concert here or you know but right. in the in the context of this album which you know has all these other um really extreme gestural pieces in it you know the sort of urgency of particular moments being so vibrant and sort of palpable makes like complete sense like it just communicates with the rest of the music on the album in the most that- natural way progressive a little bit and as, as Schoenberg wanted to see him in a way yeah <laughs> yeah right but I mean one of the best things about um having a spouse who is also an incredible chamber musician is like for whatever piece we're playing I mean spectral commissions a lot of works and we play a lot of modern pieces but if it's a standard piece that Hannah knows already usually when I first tell her like oh we're gonna be playing this piece next She's always got like, oh, you got to do that thing. Like, there's this thing that you can do, like in this one place, and like you have to do that. <laughs> um, and it's true that if you listen to a whole bunch of other recordings of this piece, not everybody does, you know, really punch that low C moment. So I'm proud we got it in there. <laughs> That's amazing. You need like a chamber music cookbook, Hannah, where you can just can look up look up recipes for how to, you know. In, inject their chamber music playing with some vibrancy. It just That's comes a- out of nerdiness, you know, like, oh, there's that amazing suspension moment or just, you know, from having um, played and, and, and sight read and just like enjoyed playing so much. I'm, I'm basically just a, a junkie for, <laughs> for cheesy, exciting, um, you know, uh, moments that, that can be captured. And I feel like one of the, struggles of, of of someone who like really enjoys playing this music is that it's so great to get together with friends and just really have fun playing but then when you're on stage or you're in a studio there's like all these pressures and things can get kind of sterilized in a way that that is um you know just it's it's part of it and it's it's part of like this inner struggle or the group struggle so it's I'm always sort of like rooting for for us all to just, you know, just do that one cheesy thing. Like just do that, just <laughs> just hold that chord you love so much. Like, why not? You know, and just sort of capture more of that spontaneous feeling that we that we have when we're not under the mic. Sure. That's yeah, great analogy. Or that's a great I mean, I was thinking in my mind, like that's true of like any performing situation that you can get tight if when the stakes are highest like to like minimize the, the amount of mistakes you can make or something like that you know it's like i think about this a lot when i try to play tennis because it's like you have to have a lot of confidence to win a tennis match and it's very easy to start playing like you don't want to make mistakes and thinking that that's how you're going to win the match which you will lose but um yeah <laughs> that's awesome uh are you playing first or second violin on this clara uh this is the first yeah it's absolutely beautiful um there's just like some stellar moments uh, in the in the the violent part i mean it's like a yeah a kind of expression that you just don't don't hear when people really go for certain kinds of of lines and really i don't know very beautiful and really awesome and i'm just i'm so impressed by this quartet because it just completely defies branding in a way like that you all just play the music that you love and you um you mix it up and you haven't been you know many 
you know, American ensembles had to be pigeonholed into one kind of category of even like almost like one composer's repertoire or something. And it's just amazing that you all can just like keep making amazing music and uh, put out an album that is as eclectic and celebrates that eclecticism, you know, even in the concept of how you put it out, which is incredible. So I hope everybody will, will check out this record and um, buy a physical copy. Thank you. <laughs> got a shout out to Chris, who's got a copy of it right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's really amazing. Thank you. Yeah, well, but uh, to continue the, the chamber music thread here of, uh, you know, that you all create, and speaking of, you know, amazing gestures and uh, this piece by Tonya Co that uh, Hannah recorded with her duo mate, Mike Compitello, uh, maybe you could tell us about this a little bit and the really cool video that you've, you've linked to as well. Totally. So, I mean, this is definitely my, my edition here for the same reason. Um, it, it's just... I think is really a true thing that once you've heard your record, you know, a hundred times or more in the editing process, you probably don't want to listen to it anymore, or at least, you know, not for a while. <laughs> so this is one of the secret tracks that I still listen to from Hannah's record um, with New Morse Code and Simplicity itself. And I, I mean, I love the whole piece. This is just the first movement um, that we included here, but to me, uh, this first movement was, I think, one of the first things that I ever saw Mike and Hannah play live. And it was also definitely the first piece of Tonya's that I ever heard, um, which was a really, I mean, it just made a really striking impression on me. Um, I mean, this particular track, I think um, it's just such inventive sounds and um, structure. And also, um, I mean, just mirrors like the, the title of the album, Simplicity itself. It's like, it's so self-contained and yet like is such a whole world of, of sound inviting you to, to enter it and kind of get to know it. And yeah, I mean, it, it really was a very memorable, um, impactful listen the first time I heard it. And since then, of course, I've gotten to know much more about what uh, Mike and Hannah do, which I think is, is similar in a way uh, to Spectral's sort of like ethos in that, um, I mean, they're not a quartet, they're two people, uh, percussion and cello, but percussion is, is so uh, ever expanding palette. And the things that Hannah does um, in this ensemble also to participate in an ever expanding palette of sound um, has always been really inspiring to me. Um, and I've also gotten to know Tonya's music, of, you know, of course, a lot more since then. And it's been great to, to see uh, all three of these amazing artists like develop, you know? Um, and I don't, I don't mean that in the sense that, uh, I don't think I really mean develop. I just mean like, isn't it great? Like when you're introduced to some really rad music and then you see what those people make next and then what they make after that. And then after that, same, you know, with uh, us and, and following what you're up to Chris and seeing, you know, how our lives intersect. Like it's, it's really fun. Yeah, for sure. And uh of course, I've known Mike and Hannah for a while now. And uh, Sazie and I both graduated from Cornell, which Tonya also graduated from. Uh, so we're all in the same kind of orbit. Uh, I actually was just finishing my degree there when Tonya was there. And I was doing some adjuncting. And I had an electronic music course, actually, that she was in. And I got to sort of like see her working creative process like up close, like through some of the assignments. And I was like, oh, my God, this person is like, the most imaginative person I think I've ever met in my life. Like her imagination is like 4D, like everybody else's is like <laughs> 2D and hers is like 4D. It like blew my mind actually. It was like, it was genuinely shocking. I was just like, wow, that is so incredibly thoughtful and interesting the way that you thought about doing this like assignment or making this piece. So from that point forward, I was just like, man, like imagination for days, like that is like, <laughs> like elite genetic composer skill or something just to like, and something of course that she's worked on, but it's just like in incredible. Like, it's really cool to, I totally pay attention to everything that she does. Cause she just always has a really creative way of like whatever she approaches, totally unique and unusual and very cool. 
I gotta say too, I mean, as a percussion cello duo, there's there are two pitfalls. One is that I'm playing a more melodic instrument and Mike is traditionally in a more non-pitch zone, or we're in like a marimba cello situation where you know, a, a composer could tend towards a sort of melody accompaniment type of texture. So one of the like leading um you know, requests we make or, or sort of discussion points we bring up when we're working with somebody new is like that we, we're really interested in finding spaces where we can be communicating in the same language, like whatever language that might may be. And sometimes that leads to kind of finding something that the two of us as people can just do the same thing. But I, I feel like Tonya completely just did the like created a different language that we could both communicate in where we were still ourselves like I'm still um you know creating all these unique sounds on the cello Mike still crushes we're distinct but we're still communicating she sort of just found this other zone like you said she went into the fourth dimension or something and found this other spot that uh, no one we had worked with yet had, had ever found and it's 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 been like you know the the example the to look to from that point forward of how to find that kind of space we could both exist in while still re retaining our identities. Hannah, can I actually ask you about like, how, how did you guys decide to be a duo? Like, because this is a very uncommon combination. You must have answered that question many times, but I actually am really curious about it. Well, it's like, very related to what we're discussing now because um, I met Mike uh, when we were doing a master's degree and then we both left and studied in Europe for a couple of years separately. We were like acquaintances, but we didn't really know each other. And then we came back um, and found ourselves in the same spot again. And we were working together on some other projects and we found that we loved so much um, some of the experiences we had had. I was in Holland, he was in Germany where we were able to really collaborate on new music with people over a long period of time, really feel like we understood, you know, a composer's intent over a period of weeks, months, and then could advocate for those pieces in like a completely different way, you know, um, instead of what we were used to in a more of like a conservatory setting where it's like, well, it's new music week in orchestra. Like we have one hour to read seven pieces and like concerts tonight, you know, and, and then the, there being all the, the stress, especially for the composers who had spent months, you know, and then right. the, the equity wasn't there in terms of like being in the same creative space at the same time. It was like completely out of sync. So when we f we started working together, those were the the grounding principles. It had nothing to do with instrumentation. It was just like, we want to work in this way. Um, we, we seem to be on the same page about this. Like, let, let's just do it, do that. So it was more about process and um, type of result we were looking for, which was like a piece that we would play many times, like memorize it the same way we play other music, like, you know, just trying to, to figure out how to put our best work into the projects we were doing instead of feeling like we were always being um, asked to do things under conditions that were going to definitely not lead to success, which is what it felt like in the in some of the, our other experiences so i love that uh, it's such a nice way of kind of looking at it kind of let's turn it all around and start with what's good sort of thing right like we want to make music together we understand each other our process seems similar so let's do music together yep. regardless so he, he could have been a i don't know french horn player too from that <laughs> point of view i suppose <laughs> yeah yeah that's awesome well, now, now, the, now the playlist is going to take a strong pivot here. We're going into like straight up basically rock and roll, which, you know, right. this, this track really like, you know, got to me because I am a child of like 90s rock and it has a lot of 90s rock vibes and uh, yep. a lot of bands that I really love, like Sleater Kinney and St. Vincent and even like Hole and Courtney Love and I don't know, some more contemporary bands like Warpaint, stuff like that. But who is this band? Uh, Om Me? Is that how they say their name? Or is it, okay. Yeah, they're a Chicago band. Um, they've been around for a while. I think they started working together in 2014, maybe. Um, but sort of like a longtime fangirl of theirs. We have some friends in common. But um, yeah, I mean, I just, I really dig their approach, which is different for every record. Um, this one, 
came out this year and I just loved, yeah, like sort of how retro it was. I mean, given everything that happened this year, like listening to this sound done in, um, I mean, it may be super nostalgic, but it's like, it's also like done in such a good way and that are saying something, you know, also that feels very real and personal and, um, and right for right now, even though it's sort of like in this very retro style, um, it's just like kind of filled a niche for what I was looking to listen to this year, for sure. And this track in particular, I just really love like the, the sort of 70s sort of break that happens. <laughs> just makes my heart really happy. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you have any co more comments on it, Stacey or, uh, or Hannah or anything, how, how you perceive this 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 track, which, which is, uh, I, I mean, I personally really, really loved it. I loved it too, actually. Is this one of the Let's Cook Together uh, tracks? I mean, is it loved by both of you? Yeah, yeah, yeah totally. I mean, it's definitely a band that I learned about via Clara, via other friends. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Put it on Let's Cook. Um, I don't know. I think it's also sort of like what I wish what my my distant future holds is to be like a, a bass player in like a red <laughs> band that does retro <laughs> pop. So there's something very aspirational about listening to it too. Um. Plus, I mean, just to throw out, you know, another fangirl thing to say. Um, I mean, like their vocal harmony is like so well done. It's so in tune and there's like so many weird um, like chordal inversions that they do and I, I don't know it, it's it's done very like powerfully I think I gotta check out the other albums if you say that they're all like a lot different that that's actually really exciting I can like dig into the catalog and see what's happening there that's I, I mean I'm super into any artist like like a Beck type or some anybody who just like has no concern for like what yeah. anybody cares about what they're gonna put out and they just completely follow what they're interested in and try to make it as high quality as possible. And like, that's just a super cool way of Yeah, existing. I mean, this one to me is a little bit more like sort of like Smashing Pumpkins or like um, early Radiohead at times than some of the other ones. And I was like, yes, this is like, this is what I want to listen to right now. At the same time, <laughs> I, I don't, I mean, they're not the kind of band that just like relies on production. You know, like yeah. the first couple things that I think I, saw were like live show clips you know where they were just doing a, like a version of a song they had recorded but like a completely different way you know i think there's definitely um like i would love to i haven't seen them live i'd love to i know they tour a lot and they you know under normal circumstances but I, you get the sense that they're sort of always thinking about different ways to do things it's not like they just you know are going to the studio and putting a sheen on it anything they, they can do it yeah for sure Crazy. And awesome. I love the early pumpkins reference too. like <laughs> a huge fan of the tracks where like Darcy sings, um, like in the, some of the, there's actually some hidden tracks, I think on the end of the first record and obviously on melancholy and the sadness and stuff where there's just like these great kind of B sides, um, there are these very like beautiful songs that didn't make the radio play, but yeah, totally reminds me of that for sure. B side used to be sort of like a musical topic that doesn't exist anymore. Like we just <laughs> lost the topic yeah. of B. <laughs> like as if we lost hunt music altogether or something. It's a B side fun. <laughs> I feel like the the new B sides is like YouTube bootleg of covers that are done as encores at <laughs> shows. <laughs> right. You know, or like or like collaborations between like opening acts and main acts like that you can only see via fan bootleg videos stuff like that that's I like mean, the new b-sides requires a lot more digging and getting lost in youtube and whatever yeah right <laughs> oh my goodness there's reminds me so much of we, spectral played a show once that was like i mean it, we play some weird shows but like this was like one of the weirdest ones you know like like the music that we were playing was like some of the most sort of obtuse, like crunchy, you know, not user-friendly, I would say. And 
somebody sat in like the second row and was like holding up an iPad and was like video recording it the whole time. And we were like, oh my God, like, did we make it? Like, are we famous now? Is this going to be on YouTube next week? Or like, are they like, why is this happening? Is there like the recording of your class? Like, we, we never found out. It didn't show up on YouTube. Is, although is somebody's really mom here tonight? Yeah, <laughs> right. Like, <laughs> Maybe we'll find our, our B-side someday. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I don't want to skip ahead. Like, the, that, that, that does touch on, like, that the Jeffrey Foucault, I don't know how he says his last name, track, uh, a little bit with the kind of the cover and the kind of, like, you know, uh, the, uh, encore that you have there. But before we get there, we have to talk about this, you know, Aretha Franklin uh, performance, which is just, like, otherworldly and uh <laughs> insane. okay so <laughs> this is this is my track this is sort of like i don't care what the topic is this is my answer you know like make <laughs> make a playlist about whatever this is on it um I, I this as far as i'm concerned this is like one of the greatest moments in human history you know <laughs> It's this this is um, a performance I've watched so many times that when I like open up YouTube, it, YouTube's like, you just want to watch this, right? And I'm like, yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, uh, yeah, this is definitely uh, one of my picks for just like any moment of any day. I love everything about this performance. I just think it's like insane. <laughs> You know, you have this is Aretha Franklin at the Kennedy Center honors honoring Carol King, who wrote Natural Woman and all, all these other songs, right? And you, I like the Kennedy Center honors, you know, honoring lifetime achievement and the performing arts. And they're always so interesting because there's all these famous people there. And the person being honored is a performing artist, but they don't get to perform, right? So there's there's often this kind of like, whoever it is, like Julie Andrews is being honored. So then all these younger like Broadway and film stars are there paying tribute, right? And and this, but this is like a completely different situation. You know, Carol King's the one being honored. Um, and, you know, all these like Janelle Monae's already sang that night, like James Taylor's already sang that night. She's sitting up there next to like, who's up there? Like George Lucas, um, Rita Moreno, I think Cicely Tyson, you know, those are the other honorees. Like, it's just, the other side. and then Aretha Franklin comes out like wearing like head to toe fur, has like her clutch, puts it down on the piano and like sits down and everyone just like loses their mind. It's, I love everything about it because it's just, you know, Carol King is like losing her mind. She's so like amazed and like honored and like excited. It's so great. I think Aretha Franklin is like 74, 75 years old at that point. The yeah. song's like 50 years old, you know? And like, I don't think I had ever seen her play the piano before, but like, she, you know, she's a great pianist. So like, that was part of it too. It wasn't like, she wasn't gonna go halfway. She's like, I gotta play. I have my backup singers, like I'm gonna come out. Um, and I, I think I sent a link that shows in on the broadcast, they kind of trimmed it, you know, like they, they're like, and now Aretha Franklin, she starts playing, but like the real video shows, like she kind of takes her time. She puts her clutch down on the piano. She like plays a little arpeggio and then she starts playing and everyone is just like, yeah. You know? <laughs> the audience and shots are amazing. Like the teary eyed like Obama. Obama's <laughs> crying. Yeah, I know. And like, you know, everybody's like singing along. And it's like also like a really, like, it's the Kennedy Center. Everyone's in a tuxedo, right? Like, it's like, nice. but it's, even in that kind of like formal setting, everyone's on their feet. And I don't know. I just, I just love it because not only is it like earned respect over 50 years, you know, like she just walks in and everyone's losing their mind. But then the performance is like amazing. Like the, the actual, like the playing, the singing, the groove, it's like a little slower than the original track, but it's like so great. Um, and then, yeah, she does like, takes the fur coat off. She said, there was like an interview. She just said, you know, sometimes it's cold and you don't know if it's gonna affect your voice, but then it was fine. So I was like, okay, let's get out of this fur. Like a Liberace moment. So just like yeah. <laughs> you know, all these like, you know, penguin suit people like can't help it they just get up and I don't know I just I love watching Carol King's reaction you know when she's the one being honored and she's just like cannot believe what's happening um so I, that's just like 
yeah, I love I love it so much. It just makes me so like happy and like um, I don't know. It's just it's just a good good thing that happened and that was captured and that you know <laughs> like it's all the good stuff. <laughs> This level of enthusiasm, imagine this about every single chamber music piece. <laughs> Why wouldn't you want to do that thing? That thing's awesome. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. Yeah, that's awesome. And the, you know, like I really, what's really cool about this on the playlist, because like this song is just like, I mean, this performance and everything is just like, okay, where, where do we, where do we go from here? This is like the most ridiculous performance and stage presence like human being in history or whatever just like basically just dropping the mic or whatever but then you have this like cool tie-in to like that it's that's also partially about like the songwriter who's carol king and then we get into this next track which is really a singer songwriter like showing that kind of tradition of like american song which is I, you know i had to like dig in a little bit to like who is like Al albert uh, brumley and i was like oh i know these songs like these are like incredible songs and um, then to get this kind of like really really scaled back version that just really emphasizes like these are the chords and these are the words and this is like this whole tradition in american music of like songwriting and i thought that was really clever actually from that aretha franklin moment to go through kind of carol king to albert brumley and into this like couch concert you know on vimeo <laughs> Yeah, totally. Well, this is exactly what you were saying about the link from before about like the B sides. Um, this is this is my pick too. Um, Jeff Focalt is like a singer songwriter I've followed for a long time, but you know maybe what I love most is like what's the encore going to be? Uh, I don't know. There's something that's so possible and applies to a lot of these artists of like going out and doing a three minute track and just it being like a gem, you know, just like it just being what it is and just letting it be what it is and just putting a few touches here and there and otherwise just like leaving it alone. And I, that, I, that's something that I like am super moved by when I, you know, you see it and, and just like, I just love that, that possibility that like a, you know, again, as like a, someone who's trained in classical music, it's so often that we, you know, we practice every day, all this stuff. And then someone's like, can you play something? And the first instinct is like, no, <laughs> like, I'm, not, I'm not ready. I don't have, you know, like yeah, you didn't tell me, you know, um, I'd have to practice and all this kind of instinct, but like someone like Jeff Foucault, like, you know, he, he knows like 10,000 songs or something, like every verse, you know, and it just, that possibility of just at any second being able to pull out a guitar and just like make something that's just a just a pearl you know is so impressive um i don't know maybe there's something about the the practicing of you know box suites and you know brahms sonatas and, and all these sort of longer form pieces that my my sort of like <laughs> heart and soul sort of like are so um um, just yeah I just reach for that kind of thing when I when I see it so I didn't you know this is not a like a, a a song that I grew up with or anything it's sort of a traditional sort of um traditional tune but you know him being able to just pull that out his wife's uh, Chris Del Morris is an amazing singer songwriter and they just sort of can make this perfect little performance like on whatever day of the week. It's but amazing. it's like, it's so much about the delivery too, right? Like it's, it's not just about the song and the song being what it is. It's like, it's about being a good storyteller as a singer songwriter. And I think Jeff really does that. Yeah. Yeah, amazing. I think, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of like conservatory trained musicians. I am totally with you, Hannah, that that's, that's one of the things that I admire most about musicians who are capable of just grabbing whatever instruments it is that they're playing and just like, sure, yeah, I will, I will give you something. Yeah. Because I always feel like, I don't know, there are like two things I can play <laughs> because I know yeah. by heart at all times, I can play everything. Right, totally. <laughs> Makes you feel very kind of, yeah, I don't know. How is it that there is so much time spent yet so little to show for, you know, on the moment? <laughs> like, right, right. <laughs> and it's not as if playing, you know, Tons of people can play guitar and sing at the same time, but it's not like that's easy. I mean, it's, and and he does this beautiful like little solo in the middle and there's the little yodeling coda. I mean, it's just like so great. And I'm sure they, you know, they can just ad-lib harmonies beautifully. Like it's just, 
you know, it has all that the grace and polish that we would practice for hours for. Um, but the practicing for hours has been like thousands of hours of just like playing shows and playing for people right. the whole time. So it just happens kind of in front of everybody instead of like behind the door. Exactly. Um, right. Which is, yeah, so amazing. Love it. Yeah. So do we have to then assume that the Paper Mice is Clara's track or is this also? <laughs> <laughs> this is a collaborative effort, I would say. Very much. Um, well, I learned about it from you. That's true. Um, Chris, do you know Dave Remenick? Dave Remenick. Why do I know that name? Why do I know that name? Well, you will now. Well, um, not the editor of The New Yorker. But, oh, right. OK. Yeah. okay exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, Dave Remenick is a composer based in Chicago. Um, he often, maybe always, but definitely often um, when he writes uh, for classical musicians, requires that all of the musicians to sing. Um, he's also someone that I came to uh, came to know through Spectral. Um, we recorded a piece of his on our, our my first album with the group that probably is the up there is the piece that maybe I have practiced the most in my life. <laughs> I mean, like, Whoa. just like an absurd, absurd number of hours spent trying to sing and play at the same time. Um, this piece happens to require the quartet to play in four-part harmony and sing in a different four-part harmony. Um, it's kind of outrageous. But anyway, he also plays in one of the best uh, prog rock bands that I know. And something that I love about this band is that many of their songs are taken from um, newspaper clippings. So this particular song is actually about uh, Blagojevich and it's called Fresh Hair, which is just kind of excellent. Um, and hair of ever. all of their songs, yeah, right, best hair ever. <laughs> yeah. This is Hannah's favorite Paper Mice song, actually. So I, I love many of their songs, but this is the one that Hannah likes to sing. <laughs> and, <laughs> and yeah, someday in another life, we will figure out how to do a, a two person cover of this song. But, awesome. you know, it's what it, it's like less than two minutes long. And it's it also has that what you said about Miguel's first track, right? Like immediately throws you off. It's got like the super clever. Yeah. Like, um, you know, meter stuff going on. But also, yeah. Yeah, it's very like math, math rocky, like uh, mm -hmm. kind of reminds me. There's actually a really great math rock band uh, from St. Louis called Yowie who you should definitely check out if you like really just like virtuosic rhythmic stuff, but also like totally out harmonically and just like super crunchy and fun to listen to. Um, also awesome name. Yeah. <laughs> totally. But yeah, this, I mean, this, I love this track because again, it just reminds me of like, there's kind of like this really crazy, like in the late eighties, there was all these bands like Dead Kennedys and like, they were just mm -hmm. totally wild. There was just like this that that wildness i don't know maybe i just haven't been paying attention a lot in like in, uh, newer music but i just love the irreverence of it and just like the high energy super fun yeah cool stuff totally and if you ever get the chance they're a band that sounds just as good live and it is like it's just like so damn impressive <laughs> live to see this happen um because of how intricate it is i also find this track frustrating because i do aspire to cover it but i like cannot sing along with it because I always get it wrong <laughs> like you know it's just like it's off by just it's it's complicated enough that um I think I know where the next like skip is and I'm always wrong <laughs> so singing along to this just involves kind of shouting like almost at the right time <laughs> I really like the fact that you gave us so many musicians from Chicago that this is kind of like a playlist of Chicago musicians also you know because, I don't know, one doesn't always know nowadays all the musicians that come from your town or from around where you are, etc. right? Uh, it almost makes like Chicago sound kind of like a smaller place than it is. Of course it isn't, but I mean, I love the fact that you're so well connected to it. And every single musician you brought to us that, that is from Chicago is totally different from the others. So that also is really awesome. The fact that you're listening to so many different music is awesome. Yeah, I mean, this morning when I like wrote to Chris, I said like, oh my God, 
I can't be people out there whose playlist is this. I want to be their friend immediately. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Well, here we are. <laughs> well, you must find this too. I mean, I think we, especially if we're like uh, hanging out together, it's like listening to something that's maybe like too close to what we do doesn't is sometimes, you know, too complicated or just not it's hard to to listen in the way that you want to or get into the right headspace. So I think that a lot of music that we have shared with each other has been like intentionally, you know, removed from what we tend to do as our main day to day work. That makes sense, of course. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm hesitant to to bring up this last track on the playlist. <laughs> Wait, I don't think what is the, our iPad died. What is the last track? <gasps> Oh my god! The last track is just so good. We'll bring it up. Yeah, totally. If, you're not, uh, if you don't know the band Starks, you look them up on uh, uh, SoundCloud right now. I'm like, I'm like red. I, I don't know if I can. Says you've listened to this, right? All of their. He kept this one from me. He actually. Yes. Share them. <laughs> Not this one. I was like, what? There was more than one. <laughs> yeah. but the other one, and I like this one too. Yeah, it is awesome. <laughs> so, I mean, Chris, I think we know of three tracks that you and your wife built during quarantine, right? Were there any more than that that all of us don't know about? You know, we had um, the start of maybe like one or two more, but we just like the band, you know, the band hit like a dry spell and we were like, we just, uh, we can't write anymore. We can't write under these conditions. You know, the, the label wasn't paying for a studio time anymore. And we were like, <laughs> 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 no, we, uh, but we did start some actually. One of them was like, it was pretty good, but we couldn't come up with any, the lyrics actually like the hardest part, which I mean, the lyrics of our songs are, are very basic, but it was really hard even just to come up with the most basic lyrics. And I was like, oh, this is why I like work in instrumental, like abstract music, because words are like really difficult. <laughs> okay, so um, this is like a super couple's goal for us. But maybe we need to collaborate. We can we can do lyrics. I think we can do lyrics. I mean, I love this track because of the like all the production, like the opening. <laughs> the way it opens and then the hook, you know, like it's, yeah, you've got it down, man. You've got how to build this these tracks together down. Well, I have a lot of students who want to study like audio production or they want to like learn that because I have a lot of non-major students who are taking one semester of composition and they have a laptop and it's just like a, a nice way to be able to make something quickly. And so I thought I might as well learn some of these like techniques that they want to know. Like I should probably like actually try my hand at it to like get a little bit better at it. I mean, don't get, <laughs> this is, don't get me wrong. These are not like super high quality, but just to know a little bit better they what, they're, great. what they're going for. But um yeah, it's fun. It's fun to try to like edit vocals and tune them. And I mean, these are, I, I would say they're a little over tuned. I might actually try like a recording of the doing more takes and maybe getting a more natural vocal at, at a, a future time, but fun just learning how to like, there's a lot of editing. I mean, the like modern pop is like an editing performance, like the amount that goes into making something sound the way it does is feels like a thousand hours or something. Oh, That's for crazy. sure. I mean, does it make for sense sure. now more to you that like these pop tracks have like 25 producers, like so-and-so got brought in just to do <laughs> kick drums and so-and-so <laughs> got brought in just to do like Melodyne and like it's, or whatever. It's crazy. The kinds of, I mean, it's straight up science with some of the stuff that they do to make certain things work the way they do it. It's mind blowing actually, like incredibly sophisticated and and difficult to accomplish unless you have like very good ears and a lot of experience so yeah oh it's so Super amazing fun. like what a difference it makes um all, all of that the production components like how the same tune can sound so i mean I, I would imagine that would be really interesting as a student um to hear in a classroom setting like taking the same tune and then you know stripping away the layers of production and piling them back on um, because like things sound so different, but I have a question for you. I want to know how many other uh, names did you cross off the list before arriving at Starks? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there's a backstory to Starks, and that is that for some reason, my friend Sean Shepard, a composer, 
has always called me Starks and I have no, I don't even know why. It's just like something that came up like ages ago and we were like, oh, Starks. Like, even though Jenny has, her last name is Auth and she has, she has kept her last name. It was like, oh, we could just be Starks. Like just, just those two people, like you could be Collins. Or, you know, like, <laughs> We've decided Lyons. our joint name would be Lollins. That would be our joint name. Yeah, see? So unfortunately, it doesn't not, have not that a lot of cool indie, uh, you know, quality that Starks does though. Yeah. I don't know if we can compare. Lollins would be like a kids <laughs> oh my kids God. band about you know but that washing was like, your hands or something <laughs> like a year ago which is also crazy um and also if clara and our good friend sam adams sent uh, me and generally a pizza because we were early quarantined before everybody else was so they were well that's right because you had just been in italy <laughs> oh right oh my yeah. god that's oh man there's something that's... really isn't the hook on this song it's gonna be another year i hear so here we are that's <laughs> crazy it was prescient that, okay that was really cute of us though wasn't it like oh yeah you know that like we were like oh we should send chris a pizza poor chris he has to quarantine <laughs> not and knowing not knowing that all of us were going to be doing that for an entire year that's no. ridiculous we were so nervous that we were going to bring coronavirus to st louis we were like we're going to be the people that bring this to this town you know and crazily enough the people who did bring it to st louis were i mean amongst many other people i'm sure eventually but the first person did take an amtrak train from chicago just like we did like hours before we did and we were like reading the news and it's like this person came on an amtrak train whatever we we're like oh my god did, is it us like did we did we do this so even if it was you you weren't first so it's, no, it's not exactly. in the clear oh yeah. man it was nerve-wracking though because there was like hit pieces in the media about you know the people that were like traveling and bringing you know coronavirus into whatever cities and wild wild times yikes but here we are on zoom <laughs> getting out of it hopefully well i hope uh you all will be able to meet someday I, that's my my grand goal is that uh you know we can take this weird uh zoom music club and uh eventually have actual real life events produced events social hangouts concerts do stuff like that and studio connect. sessions yeah. yeah you have three session musicians here to back up starks already <laughs> there we go <laughs> oh that'd be the funniest Cool. Well, thank you so much. Your list was super awesome. Tons of music that I hadn't heard before um, and that's like cool. stuff that makes me want to like listen to every artist's whole catalog. And like that's for me just like gold right now because I just, you know, honestly feel like if I can't go to concerts and things like that, then I'm just going to try to get my reps in like listening to people's work and like going through their catalog and stuff like that. And so thank you so much. And uh our pleasure. This was super fun. Thank you for giving us an excuse to make a playlist. Totally. And you know, you what you you y'all are doing here is like inspiring to just remind us to keep listening to music. And you know, we've been checking out some of your other playlists, and that's great stuff all around. So it's been really fun. Looking forward to the future playlists too. <laughs> and we got to talk about tennis next time because I know you have your your tennis rackets. Yes. So I got to get an update on what's happening. <laughs> Mm. <laughs> we'll get back to you on that. <laughs>